Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here. In this video, we're going to be testing a different spellbook variant using the new support coming out in what I believe is Code of the Duelist, if I remember correctly. Spellbook of Rudra, the destiny draw slash card for uh, spellbooks, basically. The new draw card, the new support that this deck has. Now, I wanted to go away from the Demise build for a couple of videos and then also start testing it against decks that could be prominent contenders during the time frame of when Code of the Duelist comes out. That is Link format, but there is still possibility of the uh, the remnants of Nationals format lingering around, like the true Draco decks and stuff like that. So that was the main focus of this sort of video. But so, going against the, uh, the typical pattern of what I like to play, and I'm playing a Priestess build, uh, which I think is ultimately going to not really be that optimal. Um, I think that the list is definitely pretty alright, because you get access into Spellbook Library of the Crescent in place of stuff like Card of Demise, which is just another consistency enabler, uh, but and you get access into Spellbook of Life to do a lot of Priestess plays. The problem is, is that Priestess does not really synergize that well with Spellbook of Rudra. And what I mean by that is that Priestess really incentivizes you keeping your Spellbooks in hand so that you can utilize her summoning condition and fulfill the summoning condition. But Spellbook of Rudra, it uses two Spellbooks out of your hand to draw two new cards in most, like, just generic situations now uh, now that's a big problem because of the fact that it's like you are getting rid of two spellbook cards to try and draw deeper into your deck to try and fulfill things like priestess and stuff like that but you're taking two spellbook cards out of your hand and you are definitely not guaranteed to replenish them with two other spellbook spells to fulfill priestess's summoning condition uh, so there is that so that's a little bit of built-in and confliction that these two cards will have with, the, with each other but playing against a deck like true Draco, I feel like that this engine, this like this build, or something along these lines, maybe it's like Dark Magician, or maybe it's a World of Prophecy build, but definitely not the Demise deck with Jowgans in it, is what needs to be played if you're going to be trying to play against the true Draco deck. Uh, so that's essentially what we're trying to uh, trying to do here. Is we're trying to at least better our chances against the true Draco uh, lists that could be lingering around at the time that this card comes out. And so, like I said, whether that's a World of Prophecy build, a High Priestess of Prophecy build, or a uh, or just a completely different deck altogether in the form of like Dark Magicians with spellbooks in it, just to use Fate, that's all very uh, that's all very like uh, like subjective to how things progress in the uh, in the years of this game uh, and how this game goes. Uh, but Priestess is still a very strong card. Uh, it's very strong against things like Masterpiece as well because Masterpiece can only be immune to two different things at one point. So it can be immune to spells and traps, so you can't fade it or use a trap on it, but then you could just High Priestess it. Uh, that's the theory, at least. Uh, so it's like, it's trying to make the deck more well-rounded against Masterpiece, because Masterpiece just eats the Demise build open. It, it eats the Demise build for breakfast, because all that build does is put Jowgan on the board, which is literally just not a factor against True Dracos, uh, because it's literally a tribute summon deck, uh, and also like it just it makes itself immune to spells and traps, and there goes your entire out to it, uh, in the form of they'll just start sniping off your star halls so that your stuff can't get bigger. Uh, they're not going to care about what you search because it's all going to be smaller than masterpiece, all that sort of stuff. So, a build like this or one of the other two builds that I mentioned. Uh, is definitely something that has to be done if you're going to be trying to play against Masterpiece Turbo or just true Draco variants in general that have access to Masterpiece. So that's what we're trying to test here for this video. But anyway, enough rambling on about that nonsense. Let us just jump straight into the first game and see how this stuff goes. Let's see what kind of results we can get. Alright, so going into the first game, I get to start, which is definitely a happy change from the norm. Usually my opponents win rock, paper, scissors when we're playing these best of fives, or these five game sets rather, they're not really best of fives. It's very possible to get 5 0 um, in these very in these things. But so opening with Justice and Power to get Secrets and Priestess. So I've got the makings of trying to get into a Priestess play, but unfortunately my back row isn't really something that's going to be good against true Dracos. I mean, I guess I could use a Solemn Strike on his Dynamite Knuckle if he tries to go down that route, uh, but ultimately it's not really the best. As soon as he sticks a Masterpiece, it's going to be a pretty big issue. And so if he sticks Masterpiece, it's immune to spells and immune to traps. And so ultimately, I don't really have a lot going for me as far as play structure. So, secreting into uh, into stuff, putting a tower up, and ultimately just losing immediately during the next turn because I'm just not able to do anything with my priestesses that are clogging my hand. Uh, so, like, even though this build seems to be like it's better suited against True Draco Demise, which is the build that I'm playing against, 
uh, than like something like my Spellbook Demise deck would have been, then it still has its inherent flaws and inherent problems, because the deck doesn't really build its advantage in the same sort of way that works against True Draco. Because all the True Draco spells and traps are forms of removal, it becomes really hard, really hard to deal with. Especially since like all the True Draco traps, like Apocalypse and Revival, like you want to fate every single one of those, but you can only fate once a turn. So once they start stacking up in multiples, they start becoming a huge issue. But so as you can see here, my opponent flips over Imperial Order, which was in no way what needed to happen for him to win the game. He was already in a commanding position. But at this point, I'm in a position where I could draw potentially into two spellbook cards, drop my High Priestess, and pop his Imperial Order because he's not going to be able to melt his board any further because he's turned off his own Dragonic Diagram and all that stuff. So he gets a Revival of the True Kings, um, and so I just set my Blue Boy. My Blue Boy is going to give me a Search, and he's going to attack me. I still have life left in me, so if I draw into a spellbook spell, then I should at least start to be able to mount some form of comeback, but I have no idea how I'm going to continue playing the game. But so I draw into a Justice, and I just scoop immediately because we're, we're just going to lose the next turn. It doesn't matter. I didn't draw into the card that I needed because... Priestess has such an insane, like, insanely high volume summoning requirement for as good of a card as it is that is justified, but you have to reveal three spell books in your hand, and that's, like, a problem. If it was spell books and not spell book spells, it'd be a little bit easier because then you'd have multiples of, like, Blue Boy and stuff in your hand that you could summon it with, but it has to be spell book spells, so you have to have spell cards, and it becomes a bit hard to fill from time to time. But so, next game, as you can see, starting with a Justice play. I start with my uh, my priestess. I draw into a spell book spell. And I'm able to drop priestess. He goes revival of the true kings, and uh, I'm able to use uh, priestess to pop his masterpiece. But then he just tributes it off for apocalypse to half my priestess. And my priestess was key there because it cleared the one spell book spell out of my graveyard so that I could use the crescent that I drew and start like cycling my plays through. So I'm just trying to play this game really slow and on my own basis. He doesn't have anything really major as far as accessibility to cards. I've got a fate which I can use on his field spell. Uh, so that he can't get searches. I'm not afraid of that Masterpiece coming back because it's going to be in defense mode. I can pop it next turn. He'll probably tribute it off for Apocalypse as well, so it's not really something major that I have to deal with. And I'm just going to keep getting Tower cards added to my hand over and over and over again. And I'm just going to be amassing advantage turn after turn after turn with my extra draw that I get. So ultimately, we're just going to start cycling our cards around and try to get to a good situation where things are favoring me a bit more than they currently are. Uh, but so... He Revival of the True Kings is his masterpiece back, and so now I'm at a point where, like, I've gotten enough in terms of resources that I could use to start and potentially start banishing his actual traps, like, spells and traps. Because, uh, the masterpiece is gonna keep coming back. I could banish all of his monsters and turn off the Revival of the True Kings that way. There's multiple options for what I have access to as far as play strings I could go down. But the very important thing that needs to happen is I need to start just fating. Like, fate, 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 fate. I need to start fading every turn. My turn and his turn. Like, I need to start just doing that, no questions asked. And that's the big issue. So, I end up being able to fate during his turn, during my turn, and then he just revival the True Kings back to the last monster in his graveyard, which is the Majesty Maiden. So, at this point, now I'm at a point where now I can fate during my turn, get that last monster out of the way, and uh, we should be good to go. And Fate doesn't target, so that's actually just really beneficial in this situation where I go to Fate and he chains Apocalypse to destroy his monster so he doesn't lose access to it. So I just Fate the Revival of the True King, so that's not an issue. So like it just ends up working out in, in favorable situations overall throughout this grind game. So I'm able to outgrind the deck. The deck's definitely capable of out not like the spellbook deck is definitely capable of outgrinding the true Draco deck. But the thing is, is like you have to be able to do it flawlessly. And your opponent has to not really have that good of a situation of play going for them. Like as you can, as you saw, like I believe the entire game started with me warning, warninging his masterpiece, and that was just a very good interaction. And that's what put him into this situation. And then just fate every turn on key cards while he has very few cards is what just ultimately got me access into a good situation. But so as you can see here, I'm I'm trying to life back my priestess. And, uh, and he just uses Apocalypse to pop Apocalypse. I've got a 63 attack point blue boy. <laughs> um, and so I've just got Justice that I can use. I've got two Priestesses in hand. And I've got two chances to draw into a third spell book. Out of five or eight cards that are left in my deck. Whatever that is. Five, it looks like. Um, so I'm able to just draw cards. <clears throat> draw into multiple spell books, which is good. So I drop one Priestess. He pops that with the Masterpiece because it's immune to spell and traps. 
drop the second priestess, and then we're just in the we're in the driver's seat for this game because he's at 2587 life. Such a random number that I hope I never have to say again. <laughs> but then I'm just able to power the priestess to 35 and attack through this grind game scenario. I was able to come out on top of that, which is actually very interesting. After the first two games got played out and I just got blown out in those games, I was completely expecting to get like 5-0'd in this matchup. I was like, this is just going to be a, a, just a piss knocker. It's just going to knock the actual piss out of me. Uh, but it turns out that I was able to get that game. And I was like, hmm, alright, so there's a certain degree of playability that this deck has against stuff like True King Demise, True Draco Demise, in the essence of my grind game is still just better than his. Uh, so like, that's that's just a cool little thing to note. Like it's a cool little interaction to know is that you you have a better grind game than uh, than your opponent does in certain situations. But so I'm able to warning masterpiece. He's able to do disciples of the true Draco Phoenix. Shuffle back, draw a card. Able to use his additional tribute summon for the dynamite knuckle in his hand. Dynamite knuckle gets boosted by the field spell, so he's able to attack over my high priestess. He uses his uh, his spell and trap removal on my tower, and I accidentally use tower's effect not realizing that like I was just going to give him a card to pop with Dynamite Knuckle off of the off of the uh, Dragonic Diagram. So he gets the trap and then pops the trap with the uh, Dragonic Diagram. And I was like, ah, oh, that was that was actually just incorrect for me to do. <laughs> that just 100% put me in the losing position. Uh, because like it allowed him to get more cards, more accessibility into more things. And that's just that's the point where like I just start 100% losing the game is that like I can't deal with this. Now I'm able to resolve two fates. I'm able to fate on my turn and fate on his. But he has an Apocalypse of the True Kings, which uh, which is just like, it's just going to let that Miramune just do its own thing, where the field spell that I'm banishing off fate doesn't need to resolve, and that's just a big issue for me as far as the gameplay. Like, it means that I'm just losing. I'm in the losing position to this game. So I draw the tower, have no plays, so I just scoop it up and go to the fifth game. So, <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, it's, it's a thing where like, you just get blown out against this deck. That's the thing. But so... I'm able to start my turn with a Crescent. Crescent gets me Master, and I just summon my Justice, and Justice gets me Secrets and High Priestess. So I've got Secrets, Master, another Justice, and a High Priestess in my hand. And I've got these two traps. I've got Warning Face down as well. Uh, but so he just RNG snipes the Warning uh, with the Dimensional Barrier down. So uh, kind of kind of irritating, just RNGs us. Uh, gotta be lucky to be good sometimes. I mean, I've gotten lucky plenty of times, and I got lucky here. He demises and into two monsters and then flips Pot of Desires into two more monsters. He only has like seven or eight monsters in his deck, period. And he just draws two more Desires and discards four in his end phase. But it doesn't matter. Like, it's still just way, way too far gone for me at this point because he's got a masterpiece that's unaffected by spells and traps. And I just can't deal with that. And I can't drop just one Priestess. If I try to drop one Priestess, it's just going to get popped. And that's going to be a huge issue. I'm not going to be able to play out that game. I'm not going to be able to do anything. So I try to just get lucky. I try to be like, alright, we can try and get lucky too. Let's try and Rudra into more cards. Um, and it just ends up not working out in my favor. So, unfortunate turn of events. I was trying to bait out his Masterpiece on my Justice as well for the longest. Um, but then he just didn't. Like, I had full Priestess summoning conditions fulfilled for the longest. And I was just expecting him to be like, as soon as I summon the Justice, he pops it, so I don't, you know, I'm not able to activate Fate or Master. But no, he waited until I activated the Rudra, and I was like, alright, well now it's just like, oh. And I feel like that was accidental, because like, if you're trying to keep Spellcasters off the board for me to not do anything, then you do that straight away. You don't wait. But then he did wait, and it just rewarded him for it, and I feel like it was purely accidental, based off the way that I know that he plays as a player, and the way that, uh, the way that I've, uh, seen him play even in this match uh so like it just doesn't it doesn't fit with the consistencies that i know of how earthworm plays in terms of how he does things against the deck that i'm playing like with the with the with the knowledge that i have of him as a player um from all of the sample sizes so i feel like it was like accidental but it ended up being the best situation for him and sometimes you just get that in Yu-Gi-Oh. sometimes that just happens in tournaments and it's like it's whatever, gotta be lucky to be good sometimes, gotta, gotta, you gotta get lucky in a card game, it, you've gotta have at least some luck on your side to win an event, like that's just a, that's just a little factor of, uh, of how this game works, but anyway, as always guys, thanks for watching, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below, like I said, I thought I was gonna get 5-0'd, the fact that I even won one game in this set, uh, just due to the fact that my deck is still capable of outgrinding his in certain situations, um, is actually just a really neat thing to find as far as, uh, as far as, 
results and information goes. I legitimately thought that I was going to lose five games in a row after I got blown out game one and game two. But anyway, let me know what you guys' thoughts are in the comments down below as I've already said. But other than that, check out the links in the description to my Facebook and Patreon pages. If you want to support me directly, then Patreon is the best way to do so. Also, it gives you access to a monthly raffle giveaway at the end of this month for a box of Maximum Crisis to the people that have supported me throughout the month of April. It's just a fun little raffle giveaway, fun little way to say thank you to some people and just make it interesting. One person getting a box of Maximum Crisis just as a way to say thank you for the people that supported me through April. But also gets you access to a monthly, or not a monthly, to my uh, Discord server. Uh, if you're interested in playing games and chatting with me on a regular basis, uh, then one of the reward tiers gets you access into my private Discord server. So if you're interested in that, then definitely go check that out. But otherwise, if you want to indirectly support the channel while also buying or selling cards, then definitely check out Second Chance Gaming's website, which is also linked in the description. They are a direct sponsor of me and this channel, and I'm a big fan of how they do business with what I've dealt with thus far. Both their pricing and shipping are both very good from what I've had experience with. So definitely check out their site and let them know that Phoenix sent you. But other than that, thanks again for watching. Thanks for your time, as usual. Again, let me know your thoughts on this deck and any suggestions you'd make to a non-demise build of Prophecy uh, in the comments down below. And uh, take care, guys. I will see you in the next video.